seminar. It's a special seminar today. Um, I'm filling in for David Fletcher just very briefly, so my role is really just to introduce Professor Jacinda Ruru to you, who's going to talk a little bit about what makes today's uh, seminar special. Um, well, one reason is Phil Wilcox, he's an MPI department. Um, we're really thrilled to be combining um, with you in your home uh, department here, the Maths and Stats Department. Um, and today we are joining up with Potama Ararao. It's a University of Otago research theme. We've been in existence since 2016. Um, we are um, a group of not just Māori, so anyone who's really interested in how we can bring research solutions into transforming kind of tertiary teaching practice um, from a, and bringing in and valuing mātauronga Māori, kaupapa Māori um, research and teaching methodology. So we have um, a lot of fun, um, a, a lot of um, activity in that over the years and um, at this stage, we're running through, um, each year we do an annual seminar series and it is linked in, um, it is videoed and it will become available on our website um, and there may be people joining us by Zoom, um, linking in. Um, and if anyone here is interested at all in Pautama Araro, um, you're more than welcome just to get in touch and to um, join us and join our mailing list and sort of see the kind of seminars that we're putting on uh, throughout, throughout the year. Uh, so, Phil, um, kia ora. I think you're probably well known to everyone here in the room. Phil um, is one of our Māori leaders here at the University of Otago. Really acknowledge your role, and particularly in that research leadership position that you play with Te Pautama Māori, which is our University of Otago Māori Academic Staff Caucus. And I know that you're a mentor to many of us as um, Māori researchers and Māori students um, throughout the University of Otago. So we were very excited when Phil made the move to University of Otago a few so years I. ago. <laughs> 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 and we know he's very happy here in this department. Um, I'm just going to acknowledge um, Diane, who is our um, co-chair of Te Pautama Māori, and particularly also um, Pete, who you probably all know well as well. Um, but Pete has just transitioned from a role of a our Māori student coordin our Māori postgraduate student coordinator here at Otago. And both Diane's role and Pete's roles, I think, really feed in really nicely to your seminar today around Māori capability and capacity building, which is dear to many of our hearts um, and in our aspirations to be growing and advancing and accelerating and creating opportunities. So kia ora, thank you very much for having us as part of your seminar today. Kia ora, Phil. Ngā <laughs> Um, so, thank you for your lovely introduction, Jacinta. Yes, indeed, um, I am keen to be here at Otago. My favourite joke was I managed to lower the average emotional intelligence of both places when I came down here from Sion. Um, so it's, I can always get a criticism of Simon somewhere. Um, <laughs> I really kind of enjoy. Um, so I'm just trying to flick through the slides. So, Kotine Toku Pepeha, Monokaika Monga, with the Puna Muhaka Tawa, Nati Taki Tingu Tuaka, Kahunu, Taki Tingu Namarai, Nati Kahunu, Nati Raka Paka, or Nomai Wahini Naiwi. Uh, um, so a bunch of things that I do at this university and, and, and as well as some stuff I've done previous is listed up here. Um, sort of my departmental roles um, and just uh, leading to our new head of stats as well, Martin, kia ora Martin, and I'm my kaurumai ki tēnei, ki tēnei tari. Um, so I am the departmental kaiafina, 
Um, so that's one thing I do. I've had uh, various roles um, in the division, including overviewing the science wānanga, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about. And then I'll talk about this stuff here, um, teaching Māori ethical frameworks um, to 300 and 400 level students. And I've just come out of a, what has been a really uplifting exercise in Bioc 360. Um, getting the students to actually put themselves in the position of a Māori community, evaluating a research proposal, hopefully with a bit of time to talk about, about that. Um, but they did a fantastic job, um, better than any CRI manager or most CRI managers that I've ever seen. Um, so I'm feeling very uplifted about that at the moment. Um, they should go and work with someone. Um, <laughs> so um, a bunch of other things. I, I kind of consider myself... Um, not only a quantitative geneticist, um, but also an applied Māori bio bioethics, bioethicist, I should say, um, particularly in this genetic space, uh, which I've worked in really since in this interaction space since about 2002. Um, and so I've had various advisory roles, um, including um, what's one that's just wrapping up with the Royal Society, I was on their gene editing expert panel. And one of the first things we had to do was retrofit it to make it suitable for Māori to participate in that process. So um, there's a whole bunch of things and lessons, lessons to be had about that. Um, and then a whole bunch of specific education initiatives that I'll talk about. Um, my science research, I've you know, been um, pretty much a career path scientist since I finished my undergraduate uh, at Canterbury in two th no, 19 something. Um, so. <laughs> Um, and I work on various things. I have led genome sequencing projects uh, and I co-lead the um, Genomics Aotearoa um, genome sequencing project or the, what we call the Genomics at the Aotearoa very own project, um, which aims to document vari gene, gene variability, not gene sequence, but gene variability within Māori and Pacifica in this country for health outcomes specifically and only. So, um, and then I've done a whole bunch of stuff with my own iwi. Um, I, for 10 years, I was technical advisor for Ngāti Rākai Pāka, um, the Rākai Pāka Health and Ancestry Study, which was a really good study um, and a lesson about how not to do genetic studies with Māori communities, um, and various other initiatives, including uh, my ex-wife's people, uh, Ngāti Kōhatu, which I'm still closely uh, in, involved with and engaged with, as well as some of our home folks, um, work, work in, in, in Tamā here. Um, so what I'll talk about, I'll give it a little bit of a context of this, what does Māori genetics look like or Māori interaction uh, with concepts of inheritance and what are Māori concepts of inheritance, as well as a bit of other contemporary context. Because I think that, 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 that will set up um, the next two parts, which is growing Māori capability in genetics and growing Māori content in our undergraduate program as well as in some of our graduate courses um, and then just some final final comments um, <laughs> going backwards um, anyway so I've kind of put the stuff into stages um, this is about how Māori have interacted with genetics and concepts of inheritance and so the first phase is what I would call the pre-colonization phase, which was the, in the 1870s, pre-1870s. And that was when the iwi hapu had control of the country. Um, so Mātauranga Māori was the dominant knowledge system. Māori concepts of inheritance were well known and widely utilised back then. And they are actually still utilised to a certain extent now. So I'll go over what some of, those, some of that historical stuff um, and some of those concepts. So first of all, we have kupu Māori in genetics. So those are the uh, terms, Māori words, um, that, you know, for genetics. So ira rāko, ira tangata, um, pītauera, um, ira and pītauera, I should say, for uh, um, genetics. So this term ira comes up quite a lot. Whakapapa is another concept, um, but the, uh, and I'll define that a little bit better in a minute. But other, th but other practices such as pepeha, um, and we'll talk a little bit about selection and selective breeding that was undertaken um, pre-European um, times, or pre-colonization times. And some other terms like mukapuna, which are actually a kind of a, an inheritance-based concept. So whakapapa, what do we mean when we talk about whakapapa? We kind of lose, use this term quite loosely, um, but if you look at the 
the published literature as well as talk to the experts um, in this area, um, pretty much whakapapa is more than just genealogy. The genealogical component of it is, is, is kind of kept more, more specifically captured in these terms like pākai and kawa. Um, but whakapapa itself relates to layers and interactions between layers, layers of information. Um, genetics fits in there or genealogy fits in there. And those are the things that are passed on and they talk about the relationships between and within those layers. It's, a, it's, it's essentially a very tapu concept um, in, that, in the sense that it is a, a foundational concept and therefore of huge value to Tao Māori and one of the defining values in my view. Um, and it's, it's encompassing. So it's not just limited to those genealogical relationships, um, but also to the relationships between animate and inanimate. Um, so what else can we say? It's widely applied. So I mentioned it was a core value. Um, whakapapa is um, often referred to uh, in Fai Kōrero, and even to this day at, 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 at formal events such as Tangihanga uh, and Kōwhiri, where the speakers, the kaiwhai kōrero, will often recite whakapapa and sometimes compete with each other to make sure that whoever has been buried or been celebrated is actually all of their whakapapa lines are acknowledged. And it's kind of a, it's, a, it's, it's one of those disciplines that back up that knowledge. Um, and I won't go into, into any detail about how that knowledge is passed on from generation to generation, but there are multiple forms. Um, of, of passing that information on. And so it's a framework that people use to guide decisions. Okay, so um, pepeha. So I gave my pepeha before, you saw it up there. Um, it's a means of introduction. Um, there's elements of geology and location. Okay, so I give it this term, it's all like a Māori GPS, if you like, um, and I'll use that, use that very loosely. So. There are a range of applications, particularly in an informal situation like this, but also more formal situations such as in Fai at times that's used, but it's a way that we introduce ourselves. Um, so there's mine again. Um, to me, this is the cultural equivalent of the first equation you'll ever see in quantitative genetics, which is the phenotype, is the sum of the genotype and the environment. So in my pepeha, I can split that up into where's the environmental components, where I'm from, the maunga, the awa, um, the marae, and then to the waka, which, talk, which essentially goes back to gene, this genealogical link back to who was on those, who were on those waka that came over. Um, and then our, 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 hapu, sorry, our iwi names, which are kahununu, rungumai wahine, and their grandson, uh, Rākai Pāka. So those are my ancestors. Um, and then more recent ancestors that I have, uh, te rā Te Apatu, um, and he is the common ancestor, and I'll mention him again in a minute, common ancestor between myself and my daughter's mother, um, which means that when my daughter plays up, I have no idea why I am. She's not looking angry. Um, <laughs> she hates that. She absolutely hates that. Actually, she's very safe. I'm, I'm, I'm a constant genetics. I've done the numbers, right? Um, so, so she's okay. Um, to say, well, you can play up to your mother's line. Um, there's all those other fun pops coming through. Um, and then it's funny about the Tahinga is um, actually really refers to the hundred, the hundred houses of, 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 the, of the Rangatira Tahinga. So, um, again, those are my ancestors, and I have lots of other ancestors as well as many Parker ancestors, obviously. Um, but in essence, the key point here is that, again, we can split that up into gene genetics and environment, and if we want to be really, really clever, we can split it up even further into the genetic gene by environment interactions as well. Um, those things essentially are in, uh, encompassed in whakapapa, that same concept uh, is encompassed in whakapapa. I'm going to skip this one just in the interest of time. This one um, I want to get into in a little bit of detail. Selective breeding was undertaken by Māori pre-European. Like many other indigenous cultures, virtually everything you buy in the supermarket has a history of domestication. That domestication did not get done in existing breeding programs. The domestication was done by indigenous and ancient peoples 
Kumara is no, ex is no exception. So here on the right, I, this, is, I think this is the Taputini variety, um, and then there's a whole bunch of other varieties. Um, the Taputini is this one here, I think, um, but we can see differences between two, the length and shape um, between different varieties. Um, the other one of these other ones here, I think is uh, uh, Rikamaro, um, and there are people today, Cran, for example, works from the Atikura Hau order, is a kaitiaki of kumara varieties. So we still have people who actually look after kumara varieties. There are up to 80 different names according to BEST. Um, and hapu and, and, and Fano roles around maintaining those varieties is still practiced, as I said before, uh, today. What isn't practiced today is selective breeding of humans, but it was. Okay, so here's an example, a very personal example. In Ngāti Kahununu, we have this thing which was documented by um, Tiaki Mitchell um, in his book Taki Tinu, which is essentially the history of most of the major narratives, or summary of most of the major narratives of Ngāti Kahununu. This um, term, the seedbed of the chiefs, or what it was called in Te Reo Māori at the time, Whārekereke Tango Ngā Rangatera. So what happened was two individuals, high-born individuals who had other partners and children to those other partners were brought together, the other partners and the children, I'm not sure what happened to them, but I, I can only speculate. Um, they were brought together, they had six children, they were deliberately brought together in a selective breeding, not experiment, but practice to give birth to children who would then go and lead the other hapu. Right, or the various hapu of Ngāti Kaununu. So, one of their children is Hine and Nuhi. She married Te Aputu, what is one of Te Aputu's wives. And she is my, the line that I had my mitochondrial DNA, that is the tara, the tara here, the female line descent. So, I'm the product of a selective breeding program along with many other Ngāti Kaununu. I'll leave it up to you to decide how well it was done. Um, but the key point here, is that we practice selection, right? So, um, Kaitahu had their own histories around this kind of thing as well. It's probably, um, and I'm not familiar enough with those histories to talk about them in detail, but others, that's probably, probably the domain of others to talk about. Certainly there are other histories and other tribes of something similar going on here as well. Okay, so we're moving in from that phase into the, what I would consider the, the, the colonization phase, which started really in the early 1870s once colonial rule was established. Um, and then we saw this subsequent widespread land confiscation, um, undermining and displacement of Tikanga Māori. Mā Tauranga Māori was displaced as the dominant knowledge system, um, and Tikanga was replaced by colonial rule and the religious, the, the spiritual religious norms and infrastructures that came with that, which Karaikatanga really refers to Christianity, Nihingare is the ministry, so the missionaries, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the imposition of those mainstream norms and laws, et cetera. So we had Tūre Māori, Tūre Māori, which was replaced by L-A-W, so in other words, L-O-R-E was displaced by L-A-W, um, and therefore um, the, all of the stuff that came with that in terms of dispossession, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Western science um, and associated norms became a, a commonplace, so genetics research uh, and related activities, including education, within a purely Western science framework. Um, so very little involvement and, and little recognition of Māori knowledge and concepts. So here's an example of the 150th anniversary of, of the University of Otago this year, right? The stuff that I presented on Māori concepts of inheritance was done for the first time ever in a 400 level or for any genetics class ever. So just have a think about what that, what that reflects um, in, 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 the, in, this, in the context of of, of this interaction, so a complete displacement. Not even an acknowledgement, not even um, <coughs> people even know that they exist um, ex uh, outside, of, outside of, of, of Māori communities. So that's kind of a, that's kind of a, that, that, that's something that's 
kind of important and I think uh, says something about the environment that we're still in uh, and the education environment that we're still in. Okay, so anyway, and I know that, that we are beginning to change that and this talk is about you know, the changes that are going on in that space. So then we move into this third phase. And that's really, this third phase really, I think, started with the Clark government. Um, and they realised there were issues around um, this space. Um, so we had this uh, consultation, dialogue, perspectives on genetic technologies. Uh, so that was um, underpinned by the GE debate, Royal Commission on Genetic Modification. Um, I'll give a few examples of um, some, some very difficult experiences in this country which parallel um, the overseas indigenous experiences, um, as well as the tr Treaty of Waitangi-based grievances of, 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 around land confiscation, et cetera, et cetera. But there's also, um, in, in scientific or in academic literature, I should say, um, Maori ethics-based critique and commentaries. So here are some of those um, negative examples of those negative experiences, the well-known warrior gene saga. Um, and Kaitahu, of course, took uh, Royal Commission on Genetic Modification to court because it appeared to them that the Royal Commission only wanted one Māori view, whereas different tribes have different views, or different balances of different views. Um, the Gene Kara and Ngāti Wairere saga that went to the Environment Court, that was well documented in a paper written by um, Mary Roberts. Um, Matatua Declaration um, rejected gene technology, uh, genetic gene technologies, and then of course we had Y262, which included but wasn't, but wasn't restricted to um, um, use of uh, technologies, including gene technologies. Um, the government has, uh, has, has impolitely ignored Y262, despite there being a report written about it, um, and uh, a lot of time and effort gone into it. Um, so some of the critiques that came out, um, this wonderfully entitled um, paper by Moana Jackson, The Mysterious Ethics of Singing Sheep and Feet Pointing Backwards, was a, um, it was a, was a, was a critique. Um, the first sentence, I think, to summarise it all, attests to the frustration felt by Māori about the, about the dismissiveness given to their cultural perspective during westernised or Pākehā scientific discourse. Um, and so... Again, we see this is this this is this reflecting what's gone on in this previous phase, um, and that's in, in the second phase as I've talked about. So, um, what we had in that phase still was low participation of Māori in actual genetics research and, and contemporary genetics research, and I've asterisked there, that there just because um, some of the people who some of the Māori individuals who were involved and educated in that time moved on to other professions partly because of uh, or possibly even mainly because of the institutional racism that they were encountering um, in, 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 in the, both their studies and in the profession and certainly um, it's, it, I, I can attest to the, such racism to, to exist in many organisations including the one I managed to escape from not long ago. Um, and then, but we've also seen uh, in the sort of the latter part of this phase, the development of these Māori ethical frameworks and guidelines for working with Māori communities. Um, so this is list, this slide just lists some of those frameworks. There's quite a few of them, um, and we're beginning to teach those now. Um, I'll cover that in a little bit of in, in a little bit of time. Um, Here's some examples of how those frameworks have actually been articulated into guidelines. So we have the Aratūruki work, which we started back in 2002, um, and there's a website, a draft website, which um, essentially outlines the various steps in that process, as well as the Hetangata Kaitua guidelines for biobank and mata for um, genomic research with Māori communities. These things were meant to make it a little more clear what Māori ethical frameworks uh, were, as well as how you actually went, how researchers should go about articulating their research um, and, and communicating that and what they have to actually think about, not just in terms of the research content, but the context in which it's actually undertaken and as well as the benefits that should accrue to Māori communities, um, as well as taking into account the tapu nature of things like whakapapa, uh, as well as the expectation 
of giving something has something in, needs something in return. So that's that expectation of this. Um, so I won't talk too much about that. Um, so we're now we move into this fourth phase, which I think we're some of us are already various people have various stages and, and uh, are, at, are at various stages, but some of us I think are in this fourth phase, which is essentially re genetics research for and by Māori um, to support iwi aspirations, hapu aspirations, whānau aspirations. Um, and so that's the recognition that the role of genetics-based research and education um, to contribute to well-being of whānau. Um, and we have some Māori entities that have moved beyond that previous consultation um, and dialogue phase. Um, one example is Ngāti Parao Hauora, which has made at the board level a conscious decision to get into genomics informed precision medicine and keep your eye out for a major uh, announcement about that in the next few weeks, hopefully, um, by, the, by, the, by the Minister of Science. Um, so in, in essence, it means that our communities are taking control, our groups are taking control of the research and how it's implemented. Um, that includes technical, upskill, oops, technical upskilling um, within Māori entities um, to increase our participation as researchers and scientists. And that really is a, just another manifestation of the post-treaty, post-Vaupatu uh, development undergoing, that our people are undergoing. Um, and so this, so this stuff is, is really nothing special in the sense that we're moving beyond grievance, some of us are moving beyond grievance mode. And we kind of have to, whoops. So one example of, of that is last year, um, we had the Rangahau Māori Symposium in November of last year. Um, that was the first ever, to my knowledge, anywhere in the world where all of the presenters at the symposium were of indigenous Māori descent or Māori indigenous descent. Um, and they're all practitioners of the research and we had a whole day's worth, we could have had another day's worth as well to pick up other people who weren't at least able to make it to this particular symposium. And that's testament to the fact that there is great, there's increasing amounts of Māori participation at the lab bench or at the computer interface, um, or whipping graduate students into shape, things like that. Um, so, and that, as I said today, parallels these expectations of participation, influence, and control over our own resources um, in other spaces and places. Um, through treaty settlements, you know, co-management of resources, health provision, et cetera, et cetera. Um, vision mātauranga is another thing that we need to be aware of um, and build into our thinking. Um, so what is it? So most people actually, we should all have all heard of it by now. Um, it's the government science policy framework. It's, it's, it's not a panacea solution or a panacea framework in my opinion, but it's gone a long way to increase participation and uh, Māori participation, but also responsiveness by researchers uh, to Māori aspirations. Uh, and of course, you have to write a section of it on any proposal. Um, and if you don't think your proposal is relevant to Māori, you have to justify why not. Um, but if you want to do research in this country, you do need to know about vision mātauranga. Um, the various sectors and, and, and areas that it covers, um, innovation, um, environment, health, uh, indigenous knowledge is pretty comprehensive. So, um, and each theme, of course, has a purpose, objective, commentaries around that. It's um, something that we're teaching now. So I'll move on to some of the education initiatives now that I've spent half an hour um, establishing the background. Um, so I'll cover briefly um, some of the stuff that we've been doing with uh, high school level via the Science Wānanga program uh, 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 and some other programs that we've got going on as well. Uh, Science one. Uh, just before I do that, um, I don't have, I admit, I don't have an indigenous theory. I don't have a, um, uh, a, a hapu based narrative with which I can parallel this stuff. And what instead I have is a bunch of people who I had looking over my shoulders since we started this kind of down this journey in, in around 2001, starting with um, Rangatira from um, Ngati Huranga Tarangi, which is the hapu of, of, of Fakowe, Ngati Fakowe. Um, which is part of the Te Arawa Confederation. 
And these guys worked very close, I worked particularly closely with um, Ben Huna, um, briefly with Edia Muki before he sadly passed away. And then this guy in the background here, who, who this picture is three rangatira from um, Te Arawa signing the Tree Lords deal. This guy in the back here is Huri Mutu, who um, I had a lot to do with when I was working at Simon, um, and provided a huge amount of background, um, as did these people. Um, Barry Smith, who passed away earlier this year. Meta Roberts, who's been a wonderful mentor. Kevin Prime um, has been with me for pretty much all, since that early stage, as early stages as well. Joe Hutterwetter, in my view, is a, is, is a hero. Um, and his story is really very much in that, in, in that Māori versus science and interface engagement conflict um, and resolution. Joe has, Joe, Joe sits in my mind as being the Nelson Mandela equivalent and is worth, worth reading his history. He passed away, very sadly passed away last year. And of course, Moy and, and, and last but not least, Kyla, um, who still overviews all of my research activities. And it's really wonderful to have the Naitahu Research Consultation Committee that Kyla is part of because for us, it means our mana whenua are over our shoulders, looking and seeing what we're doing all the time um, and providing that support and making it safe and appropriate for us to do this sort of stuff. So, what did, so, so I said I didn't have an indigenous theory, but what these people taught me was tikanga. Um, and the saying from te, Princess Te Puya, um, me mahi te mahi hei painga mō te iwi. Do the work to the betterment of our people. And that's really a philosophical statement um, that drives and motivates the work that I've been doing, um, and others as well. So what is some of that work? So Aneshka and I um, got together, designed a um, module, and Aneshka's here today, um, one of, our, one of our, um, our genetics master's students. Um, a module for Science Wānanga, which is aimed at pre-NCA Level 1 experiences, enhancing their experiences of science in a Māori-based setting. Um, we designed a module consisting of Māori concepts of inheritance, because they weren't going to learn it from the Western education system, um, which means whakapapa, whetwhānau, whetpepeha, etc., etc. We then gave them through an exercise of extracting, extracting DNA from strawberries. Um, talked about roles of indigenous peoples and in domestication of um, crop plants, primitive varieties, and stuff that I mentioned today. And then gave them, and then Anishka gave them as games, um, practical experiments as well. Um, but games that, that 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 gave people an understanding of what these things like the essential dogma of molecular biology were, what DNA was, and how it was all tangled up, and things like that. And I I remember commenting at one point when we were doing. Um, the Wananga at Tarkington and Marae last year. I never thought in a hundred years I would hear the words central dogma of molecular biology spoken on the Marae Atia. Um, but it, it, but you know, it was, 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 quite, was quite cool. The kids really engaged with the exercise. Their review said that they really loved, particularly the DNA extraction from strawberries um, because of that, that resembled snot. Um, <laughs> and that sort of thing really engages the kids. Um, and we had a really, really positive write-up um, in the White or Star, that, that really widely known um, newspaper. Um, so, uh, and it was done really, it was written really well by a very talented journalist, actually, and, and he captured the words quite correctly. What we're trying to do with these things is reclaim the genetic space and take us back to the past of a pre-colonisation viewpoint. And this is where we, and this is one of the places that we start. Another place, another thing that I've been involved in is the summer internship of Native Peoples and Genomics, or SING, Aotearoa, SING is the acronym, um, and it's for Māori, oops, for Māori university students uh, and Pākehi as well. So those are adults, based on upon a US initiative, um, and it's a week-long internship. Um, it talks about the uses and misuses of genomics in, a, in, in an indigenous context. Um, Maui and, who, who many of you know, Maui Hudson, and of course Katarina, who's our Associate Dean Maori uh, in the business school. Uh, the three of us put that together. Um, there was a picture of me there, but it, it, was, it was 
perhaps a little bit outdated. So anyway, <laughs> here's, the, here's, here's the real version, um, or the current contemporary version with a lot more gray hair um, and a lot less hair as well. Um, so what is it? It's, a, it's a, essentially a week-long residential internship program. Okay, so wet lab, dry lab exercises, simulation labs, which we're really talking about, including role playing, talking about ethics um, and particular scenarios. Um, and that tends to work pretty well. Um, and it's aimed at, 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 at developing an indigenous understanding of genomics. Uh, includes uh, a lot of our best researchers in the country. Um, Mick Black, who's not here today, has, was involved in the Otago, like University of Otago um, based course, the first one we had in, in um, 2016. Um, and so why would we do, why would we do this? Māori capability, as I said before, is really low in this area. Um, and so we needed some fast solutions, some solutions that actually do quick levels, or quickly raise the level of understanding, particularly of our here, um, around genomics, um, so that that narrows that, that information, that knowledge gap, um, when they're engaging with um, research, researchers, um, genomics researchers in particular. Um, so there's obviously there's Māori interest in, in, in needs and such like, um, and, and of course the desire to increase Māori capability. Um, from the science side, um, you know, we've got this rapidly changing landscape, new technologies coming along all the time, um, and the need via things like initiatives, via like Vision Māteranga, et cetera, et cetera, for consultation. So, this, so Sing is kind of like a, a, a short, a short course stop get to uh, address some of those some some of those issues, um, and it's based upon the US course that I, I mentioned. Um, that's more human genetics focused, and that was the one that started in uh, 2011 in the United States. Um, I was lucky enough, and Nishka as well, lucky enough last year to go to Sing USA. Um, you can't see the pictures too well, but I think this one is the faculty. Uh, and these are the interns here. Um, and then Canada has also got an equivalent course going, driven largely by, you can't see it too well in this picture, Kim Tolbeer. Um, and there's also one uh, being established at the moment in Australia. Um, where are they held? Um, the first day of each of these courses are held at a, marae, at a local marae. So 2016, we were at Pukataraki. 2017, Orake, Takapuwa um, here um, in Porirua last, uh, last year, and then this year we were at Mātau Marae in um, Ngāti Hui. Um, and then there's always a, always a host organisation that goes with it as well. So um, who are the, well, what are the kinds of people, types of people who um, participate? Um, they can be um, people who have gotten degrees and, and, are, and are already working in communities like David here, Putty Watson, some of you will know of or know, um, is the Deputy Chair of the Board of Ngāti Prao Hauwara. Um, Katrina is, a, um, is legally trained, um, specialises in things like dispute resolution. Currently, uh, and, be, and largely because of her, for, her attending the same course, she is currently about, um, reviewing from a Māori lens, Morris Wilkins Centre, with, uh, with a goal to establishing a new infrastructure um, for the core proposal that's currently being developed. Um, Chris Paidama is a uh, kaitiaki, this is Chris here, it's also a personal friend, um, former policeman, uh, is a kaitiaki um, from Ngāti Whātua ki Kaipara, um, and he was a co-author on a recent paper um, which um, described the use of raw species that he collected um, that have some bioactivity against Phytophthora epitopicina, which is a causal agent of COVID dieback. Bailey, um, his father is, her father is Nguyen, her mother um, is a Nikora from Ngāti Mania Porto, um, and she has an environmental sciences background. Melissa, who some of you will have seen around here, she's no longer around here, even though she hasn't finished her master's in quantitative genetics. Um, because uh, she's got a job with Livestock Improvement Corporation, um, which is you know which is a really wonderful outcome, but she still needs to finish her degree, um, <laughs> so that we can get the F's for it. 
Um, anyway, um, so, so those are the sort of people who, who come into this. The, the, the Sing program covers um, a whole range of things. Um, so Whaka Whanaunga Tanga initially, of course, Pōwhiri, to look in the local marae, um, and then laboratory, plant and gene human genetics staff, research case studies, tikanga in the laboratory, which is becoming more and more important, um, ethical, so cultural, ethical, legal, social uh, considerations, um, and then some, you know, things like um, the words up here say community-based collaboration brainstorm. That's really about putting out ideas and, and exchanging views and things like that. Um, and of course, put to sum it, to, to finish it all up. Um, just examples of the sort of things that are done. So there's some, there's some so Hayden here is a kaitiaki um, from um, Tauranga Moana, um, just doing some wet lab work. Um, I can't remember exactly what that was. This was onion squashes in University of Otago, Wellington, um, at the um, at the what 2018, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So some of the things that in some of the presentations, Aroha Mead came and came to talk about gene editing. Um, we've had Native Americans, Joseph Ereshetta, as well as Katrina Claw um, from the Sing USA program. Jo Joseph has put a picture. Um, Native Mexican, but lives in, the, uh, lives in the Cheyenne River Reservation, which with his wife is in La Um So they've come over. Tony, of course, who is, 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 is who's here today. Um, we've talked about, um, used his um, slides to talk about the warrior gene. And then there's some sort of more basic science stuff um, that's also presented. Um, so, um, building iwi capability, so a lot of people from Ngāti Parau and Eshka, of course, um, Ben Rangihunga, who's here doing a Masters in Quantitative Genetics at Swati, um, and for some reason I managed to squeeze my way in there, possibly because I was born in Kaiti, um, which is part of the rule here of Ngāti Parau. Um, so over 60 alumni uh, trained um, so far, um, over, four year, or over four years, um, and people involved in various research projects. A lot of graduate students now. Um, so Jordan is doing a PhD at Massey. I'm co-supervising. Um, we've got postdocs um, working with Tony and in, in, in biochemistry, um, and then a bunch of other people who are working at other universities. I have no idea why they didn't come to Otago, but anyway. Um, so um, I'm just going to move on real quickly so that we can we can get done very quickly um, about Māori content and undergraduate papers. So. So the stuff that I'm putting together and teaching into various pro programs is, is, is encaptured in these words here, essentially Māori concepts of inheritance. They've talked about ethical frameworks, vision mātauranga, and then Māori research categories and aspects of design and co-design. So it's in these papers that we're actually bringing this content into. Um, and I want to particularly acknowledge Paul, Katrina, and Mick in helping out um, and providing um, and, and being proactive on our behalf. And I really appreciate your guys' help there. Um, and as I said before, we just had a wonderful um, class with um, Bio360. What we did is, um, um, I'll talk, well, I'll come back to this in a second, but what we did was we put them through uh, an exercise where they had to be mana whenua. We then gave them a scenario, which was essentially the scenario here, uh, here, where as representatives of the iwi, they had to consider a, a proposal, well, things right finally, of a, from a scientist who wants to de genome se uh, sequence genomes of about 100 tribal members um, for, for, an, uh, for a, 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 an international, international collaborative study. Um, and their role was to evaluate that proposal. So we just had feedback. Um, from those groups they put together and they evaluated the proposal using the Matera framework, um, as well as a whole bunch of familiarise themselves with Māori values, et cetera, et cetera. I think we had a really, really good response. It really blew me away. And I have to say that their level of capability in this space exceeds the vast majority of Crown Research Institute managers I've ever experienced. So um, that was a really, really good exercise that we went through. Um, and it's just an example of the sort of things that we cover. Um, so that's the so this table is just the shows the paper, um, and then you know what the content is, and then sort of what do we do we assess stuff? Do we fully assess it? 
or was it just something that we pass on to people for information? This comment here, not directly assessed, actually that's not quite true. We've just put together exam questions for VIA 360. Katrina helped me with um, STAT um, 311 and Peter as well um, when I was teaching with those, with, with those folks um, in, in, in the STAT paper. So we're increasing the Māori content. Um, various other bits and pieces, I won't go into that because we're running out of time. Um, but just to finish up, um, this is just the beginning. I'm not presenting this as a well thought through set of work. It's just basically a whole bunch of things that I've you know, been heavily involved in and been doing um, and been mandated to do so by the folks, the rangatira that I've been, work, been working with. Um, so much more is needed, obviously. I think we need to look at graduate attributes and our science degrees, because in my view, I don't think they are fit for purpose going forward, and around, and particularly in around Māori content. I really, you know, beginning to, I had a long conversation with myself about um, um, a, a, a tau Māori based major or minor within a science program, and um, particularly in genetics, and the more I think about it, the more I think it is necessary. Um, new degree content, so Katrina, and Peter both um, in the egg science and in the data science um, programs have been very proactive about getting Māori content designed right from the start at all stages. So, which I think is you know, going to really be a game changer um, in terms of how we design things from the start. Um, and my dream, I guess, is back to the past, to get back to that first stage where Māori concepts um, were still used, our values and tikanga were still used, um, to, um, but with new, new tools, new knowledge, um, and a pre-colonisation pre mindset. For me, that's the ultimate um, tēnaranga, tēratanga. And I'd really, really like the um, bell tower, particularly the DBC, um, um, in, in my next confirmation path um, assessment to acknowledge the stuff that we've been doing here, because I think it is game-changing even though it's not part of my confirmation path. It's something that, as Māori academics, we do because we think it's important. Um, so, a um, lot of people to acknowledge from the Singh program, Māori and Katarina, obviously. Ben Tiaika, who's really made a huge difference coming into genomics, Aotearoa's vision, Mātou, Gordon, Ada Kaila, department, Tony, of course, biochem department, a whole bunch of other folks. Um, even Peter Shepard is as challenging as he can be at times. Um, and the university, Anishka, um, who's, who's been a real, uh, real uh, 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 really good to have you in here involved in this stuff. It's been, a, it's been wonderful. You bring a whole set of, new set of whakaro and capability. Um, and Richard, who um, put, him, put himself on the line to get me into this role. Um, I need to acknowledge that, plus a bunch of other folks as well. Jacinta and Diane, who, who both um, um, have articulate and role model a really positive way forward. Um, and we, we couldn't do this work without those sorts of things. And plus Tuwari, who's been very supportive from Office of Māori Development, and Kuro Hata, who's, um, who's an amazing man. 75 years old, and he's not going to retire um, anytime soon. Um, and that's a typical of a kaumata. A kaumata don't retire, they just keep on going anyway. Um, and then a bunch of folks who are in the Arotūruki era that um, I work with, particularly Irene um, and Meru. Um, so, with that, um, e whakāro, uh, e whakāro mūtunga, mā te ata haerere, um, nā ngā ngaru, kei tohu, kei whakatōtuhu, te aroha o tangaroa. Tread carefully in the challenging waters, lest you drown in the embrace of tangaroa. Kia ora. Um, I don't know, do you normally open up for questions now or do you go through till 12 o'clock? Is that the potential? Cool. Um, so just, um, I think that was awesome. I think that was incredibly awesome that you've just come from a classroom too in terms of being inspired by students presenting and, and walking into here and then sharing your huge vision um, and, and recognising that and the students are really hungry for this knowledge and they, the... Um, expertise that they're bringing and the confidence that they're bringing 
around um, their interest in te ao Māori is really enormous, all our students. Um, and so to see that, and I think in, our employers are also out there wanting um, our students to come with this knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I think there's a real role here for our universities and just really acknowledging Mihi to you and to all of your colleagues for what you're doing here mm -hmm. in this particular department. Mm -hmm. And I think your presentation really captured that. Mm -hmm. um, that breadth of knowledge, including the, the depth of knowledge in Te Ao Māori itself. So, yeah, kia ora, kia ora, Phil. So, yeah. um, we'll open it up to questions. And Matthew, you might want to come up and um, direct this part now. I'm <laughs> feeling like an imposter. <laughs> So um, written to the vice chancellor about this issue about how do you get more and more Maori applicants to your fourteen percent up to twenty percent, and the, the general response is is you have more students and support them, mm. which is a very good response um, because you need you need to have um, actual policies or procedures about appointing Maori into and the same like the same specific. Well, in the academic positions and supporting academics once they are in and go through the career structure. Like that. There's, there's absolutely nothing that I see from the university at the moment that that, that, that is going any way towards supporting that. Well, can I jump in and respond just briefly to that? And just thank you. And just wearing my um, director of Ngāpā of Marantanga New Zealand's Māori Centre of Research hat in that instance, and just really acknowledge what you're saying there, um, and that those messages need to go through to our BC. And it's not simply about just needing more Māori students. We do need more Māori students, but we have many Māori students who are coming through with PhDs and are not coming through <coughs> in our academic positions and not in academic positions. So we have about 1,000 Māori with PhDs across many, many different disciplines. And that's been a fast acceleration. Um, there was a vision back in 2002 for 500 Māori PhDs. So there's been an enormous shift that has happened in 20 years, and our institutions need to catch up with the fact and the knowledge that there are many Māori with PhDs wanting positions in universities and um, not being not coming through for even the interview stage. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with those comments. Um, for the few of us that are here, you know, there's a, there's the requirement from our own people to do this sort of thing. If you see it's necessary, you go and do it. And, you know, to be able to spread that load, and it's one of the wonderful things about having people like Anishka and you too, Tony, and you guys, um, is that you can actually spread the load when you've got that capacity and capability. Um, but it's hard to build it up um, and needs support, um, a lot of support and you know part of that is empathy um, to get that support and I so sometimes wonder if, if things are taken a little, little bit too much for granted um, and I suspect they are. Um, so this is, this, this is, this is, there's some real challenges in getting that capability developed and getting it developed reasonably quickly. Um, don't have any solutions apart from the fact that it does require serious intervention. Um, and what I do know from my own personal experience, um, because I was paid through my PhD by the organisation I now bag, um, 
it was a good back then, um, is that they had a, back then they had a very mature approach to these sort of questions. It was a parallel scenario. We need more Kiwi doing research, Kiwis, New Zealanders doing research uh, in forestry. So they had deliberative interventions to do that. They would put people through PhDs. I got sent to North Carolina State and things like that. So the solutions are actually already being role modelled in the past. We just actually need the, um, we need, we, we just need um, structural change to ensure that they actually happen. And yeah, whether that's going to happen or not, I don't know. Do we need as many cores as we've got, or as well-funded cores as we've got? Instead, TEC could put money into this sort of stuff. I don't know that that's necessarily the best solution, but that is a solution. Anyway, the pipeline there. Any other questions? Uh, Kia ora, Phil. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if we have any other class. I think there's another class in here, so I think we might have time if, unless people want to run away. And, and just, yeah. Can I just quickly say, you know, so Kia ora, Phil, thank you very much. I want to acknowledge what you've done to our department, um, your role as Kapi, obviously, is, a, is one role, but the fact you've brought this conversation to us today, and, and I hope this conversation will keep on going beyond today, beyond the seminar. So thank you for thank your you. mahi. Um, thank you for your also your comment too about why we do what we do, yeah. and that we do it to benefit other people, uh, maybe our families and so on. So thank you for that. Also want to acknowledge uh, Arlo Bro for your uh, contribution. Thank you for help, uh, letting us host the seminar today. I hope this will also be more conversations that we can keep on going. So thank you again, Phil. Sure.